Hashing is a concept which lays the foundation of many important computer science topics. And in this video, we will discuss that very foundation. Hello world, my name is Monis and today we will talk about hashing. At the end of this video, you will be able to clearly understand what hashing is all about. What are hash functions? What are hash collisions? And why are hash collisions bad? And we will do all of this with some really cool code examples, which you can download from the link in the description. So without further ado, let's get started. If you are familiar with any programming language, you must obviously know about functions, or as they call it in some object-oriented languages, methods. Some functions take inputs to generate an output, while others may not take an input and may not even return anything. For the purpose of this video, when we say a function, we mean a function which takes some input and generates an output. More often than not, the input almost always has something to do with the output. Now, let's take an example of a function which takes two numbers and returns its sum. Here, the output is always dependent on the input. If we change the input, the output always changes. If we send 1 and 2, the output is 3. And if we send 200 and 300, the output is 500. Now, a hash function is a special kind of function in which we have to abide by three rules. Number one, it must be deterministic. That is, the same input must always have the same output. The second rule is, the output for all possible inputs should be of fixed length. And the third one is, the output must be irreversible. So, in our add method, no matter how many times we pass 1 and 2 into the function, the output will always be 3. It means that the same input always has the same output. So, we have satisfied at least one rule. Now, if we pass 200 and 300 to the function, the output will be 500. No matter how many times we pass these two values, the output will always be 500. However, the length of the output does change depending on different inputs. In the first case, the output was 3, which is only one digit, so the length is 1. But in the second case, the output was 500, which are three digits, so the length is 3. So the add function is not a hash function because it broke the second rule. Let us still try to see if it abides by rule number 3. For the inputs 1 and 2, the output was 3. From the number 3 alone, we cannot make out the input. That is, we cannot tell which two numbers were provided as an input to produce 3. There can be a huge number of possibilities to yield the output 3. For example, minus 1 and 4, minus 12 and 15, all can yield 3. So there is no way to conclusively determine the input from reverse engineering the output. This means that the output is irreversible. Now, if we were to take a method which takes an integer, adds 1 and returns the value, it would be possible to reconstruct the input from the output. For example, if we tried passing the input 1, we would get 2. We try 2 and we would get 3. We try 100 and we get 101. Therefore, if we subtracted 1 from the output, we would be able to reconstruct the input. In this case, it would break rule number 3 as well meaning the output becomes reversible. So, let's try to write a cool function called hashify, which abides by all three rules. The job of this function is to add two numbers and then return its last digit. So now, let's try to see if it abides by all the rules. So, if we pass 1 and 2, just like last time, the sum becomes 3. Since this is a single digit, it is returned as is. Therefore, the output is 3. Similarly, if we pass 200 and 300, the sum becomes 500. The last digit of 500 is 0, which is returned as the output. Now, no matter how many times we pass 1 and 2, the output will always be 3. Similarly, if we pass 200 and 300, the output will always be 0. So, rule number 1 is satisfied, that is, the same input always returns the same output. And the rule number 2 is also satisfied because this function will always return a single digit no matter how large the sum is. Therefore, for all possible inputs, it will only return one digit, meaning the length of the output is always fixed, that is, 1. Similarly, for rule number 3, it is completely impossible to determine the inputs a and b from a single digit alone. So we can clearly see that this function satisfies all three rules we discussed before and therefore we can call it a hash function. Talking a little bit about terminology, the output of a hash function is simply called hash. 
and the process of converting an input or a key into a hash is called hashing. Now let's try to create another hash function which satisfies all three rules. The job of this function is to return the last character of a string. So if we pass confringo to the function, it will always return lowercase o, which means rule number one is satisfied. Since this will always return a single character no matter how large the input is, it satisfies rule number two as well. And finally, it is impossible to construct a string back from a single character. So rule number three is also satisfied. Now, an important point to be noted about this hash function is that there could be a lot of possible inputs which could yield the output O. It means confringo, protego, accio, ascendio, and every other string ending with O will have the same output, that is, lowercase o. When two or more inputs into a hash function result in the same output, it is called a hash collision. A good hash function tries to minimize hash collisions. Subsequently, a perfect hash function is the one which has no hash collisions at all. If a function satisfies all rules of a hash function, but has a lot of hash collisions, it is still a hash function, just not a very good one. Now, hash collisions can be detrimental in a lot of cases. Let's see how. If we take real-life example of passwords, companies don't store your passwords in clear text. They rather hash it and then store it. So with this hash, it is impossible for the developers to reverse engineer the actual password. So when you log in, the password is hashed again using the same hash function, which means it should return the same output as what was stored in the database. If they match, the login is successful. Now, if we are using a very bad hash function, like the one we created before, and your password was 123confringo, the hash which would be generated and stored in the database would simply be lowercase o. So when someone tries to log in into your account and enters any random string which ends with lowercase o, like 999ascendio, its hash, which would also be lowercase o, would match the database value and the impersonator would successfully be able to log in. So, if a hash has a lot of collisions, it is likely that many different inputs can yield the same hash, which substantially increases the likelihood of malicious login. This is the reason why hash functions try to minimize hash collisions. Now, you might be thinking that how do we write a hash function which abides by all three rules and also minimizes or completely removes the possibility of hash collisions? Well, the good news is, most likely, you don't need to. There are a lot of computer scientists who have spent a lot of time and research in developing algorithms which qualify as near-perfect hash functions, like SHA-256, Bcrypt, Argon2, and such. I have created some code examples for you to test out different hashing algorithms. For example, in this program, if we put the same string in both the text boxes, we will notice that no matter which algorithm we use to generate the hash, the generated hash would exactly be the same and subsequently will be of same length. And also, it is impossible to reverse engineer the input from the output. Therefore, each of these algorithms abide by the three rules of hashing functions. Even if we increase the size of the strings, the length of the hash remains the same. For example, the length of MD5 is always 32 hex characters. SHA1 is always 40 hex characters. And SHA256 is always 64, and so on, irrespective of the size of the input. If you would like to try it out yourself, you can download all of this code from my public repository. Link is down in the description. And if you can find a hash collision by putting in two different strings before you are 90, well, congratulations, you have achieved some purpose in life. I hope that the concept of hashing is clear to you now, but we have only begun to unfold a vast plethora of computer science topics. Hashing is used everywhere, from being used in system design concepts like load balancing and consistent hashing, to being used in trending technologies like blockchain. Stay tuned for my next videos in which I will explain the real life use cases of hashing and how interviewers sneakily test your knowledge on hashing. See you in the next video. Best done.